Greetings, mortals, on a capital day to all. I'm your host, Simon, and today I have with me a very special guest. Introduce yourself, brother. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Jay Philip Jimenez, and I'm now uh, coming to you from Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, where I've been for the last eight years. And that's a whole story, which I should probably tell uh, tell a bit about that story about myself, which might explain a lot about uh, how I came to this topic. But I'll let you uh, decide where we go from here. No, you go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay. Um, I I would not say, definitely, I would not say that I'm an expert and where i'll tell you the angle that i'm coming at the subject of the of the uh, black nobility i was trained as an actor i went to school at santa clara university and then i performed professionally and i studied at harvard at their theater training program and i went uh, then to new york city and i studied there with some professional training programs and uh, then we had 9-11 and 9-11 came and hit me very hard. Um, my whole story, my whole 9-11 story is quite bizarre. I don't know if you want to get into that. But the long and the short of it is that I felt that acting was not, uh, not going to do it for me anymore. And there was not much in terms of um, political theater or like a vibrant, relevant uh, theater scene at the time. And I was feeling uh, very disoriented. And uh, my father is a law professor at Santa Clara University. And I didn't know what I wanted to do at that point. I, com I was com uh, completely, um, as I said, the, the event of 9-11 had completely disoriented me. So I, I had been very focused uh, before that. And so my father said, why don't you come with me to Tokyo for our summer program? and maybe help me run the program. And I said, okay, uh, I'll do that. And uh, then he wanted me to do some writing and some research. And uh, my godfather, it just so happened around that time, was he was, the, he was the president of Kungmin University and he was stepping down. And my father said, oh, you know, some of, uh, some of his friends were putting together a festschrift of uh, articles and things in his honor to commemorate his his long tenure at Kung Min. And I, he said, would you write something? And I said, yeah, sure. He said, write whatever you want. I'm very busy. So I was writing about international law. I thought, you know, this is, I was very naive back in those days. This was, gosh, this was back in 2012. And I thought, you know, it strikes me that the international law is a really interesting, it's very aspirational, but it doesn't really exist. And even at that time, I could see that <clears throat> the ICC and the International uh, Court of Justice and these organizations were basically political organizations working generally for, in the interests of the, the British, I could see, and the Americans. And so I thought, I'll write about um that there's no international law re in reality so it was a very sort of bombastic uh young effort to uh you know bemoan this uh, lack of international law and a lack of the rule of law generally in the world and so it went into the fest shrift and my my godfather read it and he thought oh this is actually he really liked it so i said I said to my father, I said, maybe we should try to do what uh, the article is about. You know, try to set up some kind of international law program somewhere that would be completely free of politics. And of course, that was completely unrealistic, you know, and I couldn't think, I couldn't think of where we could do, we could even begin such a program. You know, the United States, of course, absolutely, we couldn't do it there. Other countries, China, Russia, were too controversial. Europe was completely under the uh, thumb of the United States and the MI6 and 
Africa was too underdeveloped and Tokyo, Japan, Japan was too, too much under the, the, the influence of the United States. And I couldn't think of it. And I just proposed that people needed to come together and begin put together a new international law center somewhere. And then uh, soon after that, my father got a, an email from an old colleague. They used to do uh, like poverty law in the United in uh, California, helping the um, migrant workers in California back in the seventies. And so his friend got his old colleague got in touch with him and said, "Hey, uh, why don't you come uh, visit me? I'm in Mongolia." And uh, my father told me, he said, "Yeah." The, you, I heard from Jeff, he's in Mongolia. And I said, oh my God, Mongolia, yeah. That's the perfect place because it is, generally has no enemies, it's friends with everybody. Uh, the population is very well educated, multilingual, and uh, not political, you know. Uh, in fact, Mongolia is, I don't know if there's another country like this, is friends equally with Russia and the United States. Um, uh, so he came uh, He came here and then he told me, oh, it's great. And so I decided, I said, yeah, okay, I'll, that's wonderful. It sounded really good. And then I came in the following spring. This was 2013, my first time. And as I uh, came and we did some conferences, we brought some lawyers from Japan. We brought lawyers from uh, Korea, from Seoul, Korea. And we did you know, international arbitration uh, seminar. We did a big uh, free speech seminar or symposium. This was maybe, gosh, five years ago. We had the we had the Mongolian Philharmonic play. We had the Mongolian Bar Association sponsor us, and it was a big deal. And. Uh, yet I couldn't figure out why we weren't getting this thing off the ground and we weren't getting support, you know, because I naively thought, well, everybody wants international law. Everybody wants justice, you know, uh -huh. and uh, <laughs> who, who would not want this? Why aren't people throwing money at, at us? And, you know, I came here, I had some pretty good contacts. I knew the, the, um, minister of culture and i had met the prime minister and i thought everything was just going to go very quickly and uh, i got an invitation it was a colleague of my father's who became my good friend he's sort of like another very important figure in my life and he was with unesco uh this was just after that he was um he wrote the book on the protection of cultural property in, in the event of armed conflict for UNESCO. And his name uh, was Dr. Yerji Toman. And he passed away a few years ago, uh, ostensibly of COVID, but he had a lot of uh, other health issues. And I was just absolutely the last couple of years that he was on this planet, I was just feeling so bad. He said, oh, you know, I don't think I can come to Mongolia. He had really been a huge inspiration for me to keep to keep this idea going forward. But back in uh, 20, this back in 2013, he said, he said, I want you to come to Vienna and I want to introduce you to Karl von Habsburg. And I think he would be very interested in your project. And I said, wow, this is very exciting, you know, Karl von Habsburg, okay. So I went to Vienna, we had a great time. I met uh, Karl, we had a little dinner together in this old uh, inn where Beethoven had written, I think his third symphony there. And he seemed, oh yes, it sounds like a very good idea. And so I got sort of his very, um, uh, casual sort of blessing. Yeah, it sounds very good, wonderful. And so then I went back to Mongolia and I was feeling like everything was going, going to go really well. Um, and nothing, I never heard back from Carl. 
uh, my friend Yerji Toman, he, Dr. Toman was always very supportive of me and I'm, I haven't given up, you know, I figured it took me 10 years to get this far. I'm probably going to go another 10 years at least. I'm not giving up on this. Um, Winners it's never win. To, uh, that's right. <laughs> exactly. And you know, the time frame. if you think about it, um, 20 years is really not much to do something uh on the scale that i would like i would like to initiate something on on a on a larger scale and uh you know 20 years is nothing really when you get when you get down to it and and you're correct uh quitters never win and every time i think oh my god you know things keep happening covid happened and um one thing that happened was when i got here Mongolia, the economy was doing really well. It was booming. It was something like 17% growth a year. And uh, we thought, oh my God, this is the perfect time to go. It's booming and everybody loves me. And, and this project is such a great idea. And uh, then everything came to a, a screeching halt. And I couldn't understand it at all. I said, you know, we have all of these resources. We have like trillions of dollars worth of natural resources in the ground we've got a 97 percent literacy rate all you know we've got mongolians people are just absolutely amazing most wonderful people i just feel so lucky to be here and i just was i couldn't understand why we were we had like hit a wall and uh then i started reading more and more and i started about this thing called a resource curse which afflicts countries in africa if you have resources you know people are going to come in and make sure that you do not develop because they want access they want easy access to your natural resources and uh they don't want you particularly to develop to the point where you can take control of your own resources and i'm like oh that's very interesting you know i had no idea about this but one of the things i did that led me to this was um I'd been through 9-11 in, in New York. I, I was living in New York at the time. And I had kind of sensed that something, my whole story is very bizarre. I don't know if you want, want to get, if you do at some point, just ask me. <laughs> but um, I, I, said, I came to Mongolia and I said, okay, I want to start this program in international law. It, it needs to be like a clean slate, start from scratch. Um, I need to know basically how the world is run. What's the truth about, about it all? And I said to myself, I said, you know, I was in New York for 9-11. I hear, I know there are some people that don't believe the official story. And I know they're probably crazy, misguided people, but let me, just in the interest of fairness, because I'm supposed to be about international law and eternal principles, higher law, right? All right, let me look. I said, I will look at the five best reasons they have to not, to doubt the official uh, version. And then I will, you know, spend the rest of the day refuting those and checking them off. And then I'll feel secure that the official version was the correct one. And <laughs> well, I came across like five reasons that could not refute I couldn't find any refutation, any counter argument. And I said, oh, geez, you know. Building seven. What do, huh? Building, building seven. Building seven, one, one major one. I, you know, I remember, the odd thing is, I remember watching TV the next day. <clears throat> uh, building seven was very bizarre, but it's very interesting when you are in the middle of a crisis like that not when you when one you know some people kept their wits about them and could see see some of the the cracks in the narrative but you know for the average person you're kind of freaked out you hope that the that the authorities are taking care of everything and maybe if if you have kind of a critical uh, if, if you have some uh, pathways, neurological pathways of some critical thought. Maybe some of the things you see don't quite add up. 
but well, you go along it. with it. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> I just, um, I, I remember looking at the video, like I was trying to look at the, the size of the plane and the amount of fuel that would be on the plane and then looking at this big steel building and then looking at all, you know, it didn't quite add up, but I didn't say anything. I didn't say a damn thing to anybody. And um, so I had I had bought into it. So then uh, when I was in Mongolia and I had then begun to question it and then I could see why, you know, then I things started things started to click in my mind. Then it became clear to me that the official story was ridiculous, in fact. And I, I read everything. I looked into everything. And I eventually found uh, a, not a researcher. He was somebody who was directly involved in 9-11, a Russian guy, Dmitry Khalazov. And he wrote this amazing book called 9-11 Thology which is a 1200 page book where he goes into absolutely granular detail about the whole operation. He had been um, a nuclear explosives uh, specialist in KGB. And he had known, he had been involved, he had been involved with the main planner without knowing what he was into. The main planner had sort of been tailing him and then introduced himself and then asked him some questions and on the basis of that uh the operation was planned by a guy named mike harari so uh who was mossad uh but a french citizen as well and worked with the bushes so i was like oh my god and then i i said okay let me get into some other other hot topics you know, that when that domino fell, and then it was a series of others. And um, I had would say, okay, I need to find out what is at the top? How does this structure, you know, the whole idea of the pyramid and the sort of pristine global hierarchy never quite sat with me, didn't sit well with me. And then at some point, just very recently, I stumbled into the, you know, the black nobility. And um, I'm still uh, very much wrestling. It's an enormous topic. It's absolutely huge. It's like somebody dropping. It's like you're walking down an alley and somebody drops this octopus on you and you don't know what the hell it is. And it's got a thousand arms and you're trying to figure out what it's all about. There's the... Um, the version that you see on on YouTube, uh, where it's all coming from Venice, which I thought it was, you know, the black nobility in Venice, basically the same thing, but it's it's not. Venice is a very important aspect of it, but it involves pretty much all of the royal houses in Europe. Um, people have said that it starts with the the Este family, and then uh, sort of becoming the Guelphs and then the Hanoverians and the House of Orange and, and the, the House of Windsors and Wittgenstein and, and, um, and all of the others. So it's become, you have, uh, on the one hand, you have houses from the, the Holy Roman Empire, the Northern tier or also Southern German and northern tier houses that intermarried with the Venetians. You have the old Roman families, like the Colonna family that goes back to the time of Julius Caesar and a couple of the others. They have their own organization. They consider themselves to be extremely special. And uh, then you have the, the, uh, the Venetian black uh, nobility, which I think uh, I would say they are at the heart of it in terms of the the financial wizardry, the financial power, and the kind of epistemological uh, methodology behind uh, this whole enormous mass swirling kind of always shifting and changing kind of grouping of nobility. So it's not it's not as simple as to say, well, these are the top families of, the, of Venice and that accounts for everything. And I could see then that um, 
and the House of Habsburg as well. Um, does it have could, any? Does it have any connection to Babylon? I've often heard it referred to as the Babylonian Brotherhood. Yeah, that is something uh, I've. In, in my research, I came across the ancient uh, Babylonian city of Tyre, or the Canaanite city of Tyre. And I don't know, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. I know it has to do with money magic and and usury, but I'm I my expertise, to the extent that I have any at all, uh, does it go back that far? What What is your understanding of that? Um, I think it comes from uh, Helen Bavatsky. She talks about the uh, Babylonian Brotherhood. I don't know much more about it than that. It's just something I've heard. I yeah I I I'm very dubious about Madame Blavatsky. I think she was a British agent, and I think they were fomenting a kind of irrationalism. Um, I've done a lot of research into the the figure of uh, Le Comte de Saint Germain, and uh, he was a very active, very pragmatic political figure, who was obviously an aristocrat himself who thought very highly of the, the aspirations um, of the American Revolution and freedom more generally and development and uh, the real economy, cre making things, creating things, building real value, education. And his, uh, you, you know, the more, the more mystical aspects of him were sort of uh, co-opted in the late 1800s by people like Blavatsky and maybe Rudolf Steiner and, and some of these other people. Would but, the, uh, would the uh, English House of uh, Royals, would they be counted as the black nobility or are they like lower on the pegging pole? Uh, the house of, the house, the, she's definitely descended from the house of Este She's definitely a Guelph and the House of Saxe Coburg. They're all, you know, intermarried from, you know, you, you can go and see uh, the Kaiser, for instance, the Kaiser in Germany, who was from the House of Hohenzollern, was basically the nephew of, of uh, Edward VII. And Edward VII was able to go over to Germany and say, you know, this uh, Otto von Bismarck that you have, as long as I, as long as he is, as long as he's your chancellor, no one's going to take you seriously as an emperor. Everyone thinks that he controls everything, and so he got his stupid uh, nephew to fire Bismarck, and then it just went downhill from there. That's how they got. That's how Edward the Seventh got his his uh, world war at that point. And they're related to the Romanovs as well. So you have this expansion in a continual intermarrying, which uh, I found to be uh, almost overwhelming. When you look at a house like the House of Savoy that was responsible for bringing Mussolini to power and um, who came into uh, Rome in 1871, you know, and declared that uh, the Pope was no longer the uh, head, imperial head of everything, and uh, some people say that that's where this label of black nobility comes from, that the nobles who were loyal to the Pope closed themselves up in their houses and shut their windows and stayed in the dark until, well, the Lateran Treaty of 1929, uh, where, where the, the um, the Vatican was established as a sovereign entity at that point, but the House of Savoy, then they are connected with, um, uh, uh, you know, the Wittelsbachs, and they're, they're and like, you can see where all of these major powerful, the Habsburgs, you can see where they continually intermarry, and you take a house like the House of Borghese, very powerful, First of all, you need to understand that these major houses, House of Bourbon, that would be the House of Bourbon Two Sicilies, the House of Bourbon Parma, um, uh, the House of Savoy, the House of Medici, 
Medici was originally a, a Florentine family. You know, that's a wonderful story what happened with Florence and the Renaissance, which was in, a, in effect, in an epistemological sense, and uh, in the entire outlook, it was, a, it was an attempt to offset the monetarism and the predatory uh, uh, behavior of Venice. You had Florence, but you know, now the Medicis are one of, essentially one of the black nobility. They're very powerful in Hollywood, um, very dangerous people. You don't want to get on their, their bad, bad side. Time. And so, <laughs> and of course, uh, the Queen of England, and uh, you have this connection with the Queen and the House of uh, Pallavicini. The Pallavicini's, I think, bankrolled the, the England during the um, the war against Spain, and uh, you had the Pallavicini's also bankrolling uh, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, and the oh. Pallavicini's incredibly. Uh, powerful. They have a palace in Vienna, which I saw last time I was there last year. Um, and you look at the size of these families, the reach that they have, the fact that they own all the mafias, all the mafias in the world are connected to one or several of these families who kind of converge. If, if you look at, uh, say, for instance, MS-13 or the Mexican drug cartels are generally owned by uh, the House of Bourbon or the House of Torlonia. Is it um, the same with Cosa Nostra? Yes. Yeah. The Sicilian Mafia is owned uh, through vari various uh, families. Probably the center, um, the center, I would say, at the core of the black nobility probably the most powerful family would be, from what I've read, would be the Massimo family. And nobody's um, ever heard of them. Right. <laughs> and if you look at who's at the top of the, who's at the top of the, the head of the household, he's, no one's ever, you know. They don't um, need to use. He, he's, you know, very, uh, very, I mean, what, what can I say? I, I had, um, you know, I did a, I did a few podcasts with 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 uh, Ian Ferguson. You know, White Lotus yeah. of Light. And uh, one day he texted me. He said, Phil, "Philip, um, someone's asking in my comment section about the House of Massimo." He said, "You know, you know more about this. So, would you please go on my site and answer the question?" And I said, "Okay, sure." Uh, so I went on and I kind of went went on at length about Massimo, how they own, you know, the Clerkenwell cl crime family in, in London, other things, and, you know, that they're the t one of the top owners of the Vatican, and the head of the family claims that he owns all of the corporations that are nations. So nations are corporations. And he owns, apparently he owns them all, like, like a deck of cards. And a, a lot of, um, very connected with the drugs, very connected with um, a, a lot of other things too. I don't, you know what, I don't actually pass uh, judgment on these people, and, but I'll tell you why in a minute. So I wrote a little bit, uh, and 30 seconds after I answered this person's question and I posted, um, it disappeared. What? Yeah, That's it just weird. vanished. And I thought, hmm, maybe, maybe the internet connection in this cafe is not very stable. <clears throat> uh, I will go ahead and do it again. So I typed in, again, I added a few extra things. I hit uh, post, and less than 30 seconds later, it disappeared. <laughs> well, let's hope this video stays up. Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to get you in <laughs> trouble. Uh, so I'm not going to go into too much specifics uh, on some of the darker things. Um, 
you know, the other, the funny thing was I, I had posted some other comments. They stayed up just fine. You know, it was just those. The thing is, these people have uh, armies of gang stalkers and hackers who like are continually combing the internet for, that's why I'm not saying the name of the head of the household. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of admiration for the guy. I mean, really, if you look at it, uh, <clears throat> we're all in quite a bind, you know. The reality is, as I see it, we live under feudalism, and we've never gotten out from under feudalism. It has these disguises, you know, democracy, communism, fascism. But, um, you know, the royal houses, the houses that no longer, they're no longer on thrones anymore. Some of them don't have territory, but they have incredible power. And the Holy Roman Empire uh, still kind of exists. Uh, you have the um, Holy the, Roman Church. Yeah, the Holy Roman Church. That's the Catholic Church, but the Holy Roman Empire. You know, the one who was it who, who joked that it, it's neither holy nor nor Roman nor an empire. Was that Voltaire? <laughs> and it it came to power really in into the forefront. I mean, I, I would argue that it goes back to Clovis, but some people say that most people agree that it was Charlemagne when he was crowned by the Pope on Christmas Day in 800. That was the christening of the Holy Roman Empire. But you have, um, it's based on something called um, Arian Christianity. And it was kind of a federation of these little duchies and sort of, little kingdoms and fiefdoms, all kind of a patchwork, and a bit on the in, informal side. And you had the the uh, Habsburgs ruling for, that was most of the period of the Holy Roman Empire for about 600 years, you had Habsburg rule. But you had other families in there. You had the Esterhazy, um, Aursberg, Fürstenberg, Fugger, the great banking house of Augsburg, Fugger. Well, the Fugger family were uh, educated in Venice. All the young men in the Fugger family went to Venice to be educated on how they were to proceed. Uh, Hohenlohe, uh, Orsini also, uh, Sein Wittgenstein, Schwarzenegger, and um, a family called Torn und Taxis, who came from that's they're really an interesting family just as a as sort of a case study being that uh, they came from bergamo italy which was kind of a satellite of venice and they transplanted themselves into germany they were torre tasso and they moved to germany they changed they deutschified it right into uh torn on taxis and they took over the postal service which was kind of a cover for their taking the leading role in the um, the Venetian intelligence service, which was the which may be. I mean, I don't know. I I can't tell you for sure. I'm sure elements of it still exist, but certainly uh, up until very recently, I would say until the 80s or 90s, you could have argued that the Venetian intelligence service was uh, premier in the world, the most important, the most powerful, the most deadly. And the House of Torn and Toxis were, some people say that they were behind the Habsburgs, that they kind of propped up the Habsburgs, that they were the real power. But one of the secrets that they had for maintaining their power was that they never sought political power. They liked to stay in the back a, a little bit. And in this way, they kept this continuity going for this family with this incredible power and wealth for 800 years. So you had in, in the 80s, it's a really interesting interview with Prince Johannes. He's since passed away, but Prince Johannes in 1982, uh, Torn and Toxis, he said he was the richest man in the world. And back in those days, he was declared he's worth $5 billion, which back in the early 80s, that, that might have just uh, done it, you know, in terms of 
establishing you on that level. He was probably worth a lot more than that, but that's what he declared. He uh, owned Gregensburg and something like five castles, 15 castles. Hmm. And he declared he was always in and out of the White House. That's the funniest thing. That's the strangest thing. That's the most frightening thing. Um, as you look at the United States now, someone like Johannes Thun and Toxis back in the early 80s, he might have been, according to this one interviewer, I read a couple of his interviews with great interest and I wrote, I took a lot of notes, like uh, a lot of notes on the series of interviews. He said, you know, at the end he was shaken. As he said, he, he, think, he thought back in 1982 that uh, Count Johannes, Prince Johannes, Count Johannes, uh, that he might have been the most important single individual in Washington at that time. Um, I've since, uh, I have a friend in, in Austria who knows a lot of these families. And I asked him about the Torn and Taxis last time I was there. And he said, oh, they've lost a lot of their fortune. They're not really important anymore. The, the houses that you really want to look at are like the House of Liechtenstein, <clears throat> very important in banking, right? Have so, you heard of Wallenberg? In uh, Sweden? Yeah. Yes, of course. I think it's true, perhaps, that this the, the first central bank, the first large central bank was in Sweden. Isn't that true? It might be. It might be. <clears throat> I know, I know the Wallenberg pretty much own Sweden. They're always right. on like dinners with politicians and so on and so forth. They're very important and they're connected to the Rothschilds as well. Just, just but probably, there. probably they're more important than the Rothschilds. You know, probably. the thing with the Rothschilds is that, you know, you go back to the time of Rome. Uh, the royal families have long uh, had adopted this tactic where they push the Jews to the front so the public sees the the court factors, you know, the court Jews, and everybody points to them. Oh, when things go wrong, look, you know. <laughs> but in, in reality, <clears throat> you know, if, if you want to look at where the power really is, you look at the house of Torlonia, you look at the house of Wallenberg, um, even th this kind of um, uh, fiction that the Windsors are subservient uh, to the Rothschilds and, they, and everybody on the internet, they post that picture of is it Evelyn de Rothschilds poking Prince Charles's chest. And he's a bit taller, you know, but it's supposed to indicate, oh, this is proof. Um, I don't buy that for a second. I think the Windsors have a lot more money and a lot more power. And the Rothschilds are bankers. They're employed by them. The Rothschilds were initially promoted and, and hired, if you will, by the House of Hesse and then um, the House of Habsburg. So they're essentially bankers. They, they're employed by these houses. They're employed by the Windsors. Uh, people want to believe that these people are at the top of the world, uh, this hierarchy. But what I've seen is, firstly, that's absolutely untrue. Um, secondly, that it is a not it is not a neat and clear uh, organization at all. It is completely messy. Most of these people are completely insane. They have superiority complexes. They have god complexes. They have more money. They some of them measure their wealth in the trillions. And they literally control all the banks. They control everything. They control all the mafias. They control the black markets, um, the, the drug empire. You also have people who say, well, it's the House of Windsor. They're on the top. They, they're, for instance, the, I don't have a problem talking about them. I'm not afraid of them. I should be, but I'm not, you know. But, you know, people <laughs> say that they're on the top of, in terms of uh, human trafficking in the world. But I would say um, Princess Diana actually talked to a, a confidant. She never wrote about it or spoke about it publicly, 
But uh, several times, regularly, she and the queen would go to Venice and they would meet with um, Elvira uh, Pallavicino, Pallavicini, who was the matriarch of the Pallavicinis, and they would go there and pay tribute and have a, a tete a tete, you know. And at these meetings, the queen said, absolutely, you're never, never to tell anybody about these meetings. So all we know is that they happened. It makes sense, though, um, given, given the history of the Pallavicinis, incredibly powerful. They have tremendous authority, even over the Islamic world. Um, one member is uh, one of the key, most powerful people in, in Islam. You, you can look at the religions uh, worldwide. That's another area where the black nobility controls all the religions. And I would say it started from a, a place of uh, cynicism. The relationship with the Pope, for instance. Oh my God, this is such a huge, <laughs> such a huge subject. Now, if you look, you go to Rome, we have this Jesuit Pope. The Jesuits are not really Christian. They're not really Catholic. The Jesuit order was uh, set up by the Venetians, by uh, Venetian, um, it was a cardinal actually, but he was, a, he was one, of the, one of the top oligarchs, uh, Gasparo Contarini. This was after the, uh, there was, uh, the Venetians were so horrible they had basically had this financial war with Europe. They, first of all, they were, didn't consider themselves to be part of Europe. They didn't consider themselves to be part of Rome. They were part of the, the Byzantine Empire. And then they were even declared, they even had sovereignty in, in that context. So they had bankrupted almost all of Europe uh, by 1500. Finally, in 1509, France, Spain, the Pope, most of the uh, Italian city-states, um, the Holy Roman Empire, they had all had enough of Venice. And uh, they signed this document, you know, we formed the League of Cambrai, we are going to take out Venice once and for all. This is something we need to do for the sake of humanity. These people are monsters and let's go do it. And uh, Venice, came within an inch of completely being wiped out. And at the last minute, they made a deal with the Pope. They said, oh, we'll give you back some of your uh, papal states. And uh, this um, Venetian uh, patriarch uh, by the name of Chigi, the Chigi family, to even today, very, very powerful. Uh, they, he came forward with some money and they were able to uh, pay for some mercenaries and, uh, and fight their way out of a very tight situation. But in the, the battle of uh, where they lost to France, almost they lost. It was interesting because Machiavelli, he was deeply opposed to, to oligarchy in general. He was a great crusader for freedom and for human dignity and for... Uh, an educated, empowered citizenry. Uh, he's not at all what how people characterize him. He was not when he wrote the Prince. He was not advocating though. This is how you should behave. He was not of that. He was just warning people. This is how the game is played. You better be aware of how it's being how it's played. And I'm going to you know make sure that you're hip to how things are done. And you're foolish if you don't understand reality. But uh, he was uh, he was ecstatic at the where when the Venetians were defeated at the Battle of Agnodello, uh, and but the but they managed to like worm their way out of that situation and stay afloat. But uh, atop the Doge, at the, I think he was the Doge Antonio Contarini, he said, you know, Agnodello was punishment because of our lasciviousness, our selfishness, our greed, our excesses, our immorality. 
we nearly were destroyed. We need to reevaluate uh, our tactics in the world. And uh, one of the things they did, which is characteristic of the Venetian method that the British are still, still continued to exploit, that the British inherited because of the infiltration of the Venetian party around the time of the Henry VIII, the British, I'll, I'll tell you how this goes, but um, they thought, you know, we're really nervous about getting invaded by these Germanic tribes. These, you know, Germany could come down and wipe us out at any time. We're very vulnerable. So uh, uh, Gasparo Contarini, he heard through his, uh, what's his name, Lucianus Rufus in Germany, and he had an accomplice, what was his name, Spalatin. And they had heard about, they found this guy, Martin Luther, and he was a very rough, very powerful, charismatic character, but very, uh, very of uh, diamond in the rough, you know. And he had this idea that it was through faith alone, not through works, that you're you're saved. And Gasparo Contorini had a similar kind of awakening that it's yeah, it's not what you do in this world. It's just by faith, your connection. This is the only thing that saves you from damnation. So he started to think. He was able to sort of promote and fund and promote the work of Luther through publishing houses in Venice. And they published uh, something like 40,000 editions of, of uh, Luther's uh, works. And then they distributed them. And this kicked off this uh, intense religious conflict in uh, Northern Europe. So it was engineered by the Venetians and it was coming at a time of war where the Venetians were uh, on the verge of being exterminated, basically, and use a very classic divide and conquer strategy. And at that point, uh, the Venetian oligarchy kind of split. You had uh, the Nuovi, the new houses, and the ve Vecchi, the old ones. The old uh, houses tended to be more oriented toward the pope and the old uh much older houses with a more direct connection with the, the vatican and the nuovi they were pushing to say hey look uh you know christopher columbus has gone to the new world there's all this gold coming in the world is no longer just in the mediterranean we cannot control the world from this little uh you know swamp in uh, north of the Adri we've of the adriatic we have to diversify we have to relocate we have to uh, adapt so they began setting moving more i would say to geneva was i think in my own opinion my own opinion is that geneva is the head of the snake geneva is the most important city geneva is what governs the world but the as i as i as i understand it venice is the heart and the brain, the office of this whole operation is in Geneva. But then you had, uh, they moved also a great deal of the, it's based on the Fondi. Uh, you know, Venice, I'm really, I'm not a scholar, so I'm kind of all over the place <laughs> in discussing this. I hope it's somewhat clear. Venice had acquired- track of. Yeah, okay. I'll slow down, but I apologize to people. I, I don't uh, pretend to be a scholar or a, uh, an expert. I am somebody who's working with this information on a very specific project. Um, have you ever read Have you ever read the, the 13 Bloodlines of the Illuminati? I think it's a book. Uh, no, I haven't read it, but I've heard of it and I've seen, you know, I've seen that the chart that shows the 13 uh, Is that families. pretty accurate? They, I don't, uh, I don't, uh, or, I or, don't uh, think that. so. I've seen, I know that there are families that are extremely powerful that are not uh, listed there. And it's interesting, a lot of people leave out the Massimo family. 
and or they leave out the house of Savoy, they leave out the house of Bourbon II Sicilies. Uh, the Bourbon, house of Bourbon II Sicilies, practically Prince Carlo, he's running, um, you know, Joe Biden and, and Justin Trudeau. I mean, this guy is, you can see pictures of Trump meeting him and it's very obvious. He's a, he's a very powerful, very charismatic uh, guy with, um, you know, the, the people that we see in the West, the politicians, the people that are held up as leaders and powerful people, these people are nothing, you know? They're the hired help. They have no seniority, they have nothing. They're easily replaceable. Even people, people we talk about, Bill Gates or Elon Musk, what, what these people have is just, um, is chump change compared to what some of these big, these big houses, the House of Braganza, the House of Aldo Brandini, the House of Torlonia, they are overseeing the, the Bank for International Settlements. You know, um, you have the House of Farnese that advanced the Jesuits. I kind of, I was going to mention how the Jesuits were formed and I was explaining how they were not really Christian, how they were a military religious order who were created by the Venetians and then embedded in the Vatican to serve the interests of the Venetian uh, nobility. Oh, that's super interesting. I didn't know that. I know the 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 Jesuits have uh, a strained relationship with the Templars. T tell me about that. Uh, I, I just because the Catholic Church burned uh, the or Grandmaster uh, Jacob Livre Frey or whatever his name was. Right. Right. So uh, the Templars have had a uh, strained uh, connection with the uh, Catholic Church since then, and especially yeah, the Jesuits. I, I was thinking about that. I think maybe it was uh, competing for power. Probably. I know very little about the. I know very little about the Templars. Um, maybe that. Maybe this overlaps with the uh, sovereign military order of Malta. The Smom? It, it it does, for sure. Okay. They're strongly connected, the Templars and the Kings of Malta. But they're competing factions as well. Yeah, this is what people don't understand. There's a, there's a lot of backstabbing and constant... Things are in constant flux. Things are very messy. You have all these egomaniacs and people who are... Uh, killing each other one minute, you know, uh, go forward a few decades and they're working together like the Genoese and the Venetians. They were at each other's throats. There was warfare, you know, but in the end, they settled into a solid, stable kind of relationship where the Genoese were sort of junior partners of the Venetians. And uh, sort of you had the Genoa, Venice, Geneva uh, group grouping that. Uh, came to dominate and work as work as one thing, but I understand that the SMOM, the Sovereign Military Order of Malta, is more powerful than the Vatican, and it actually has probably the highest level of uh, military authority on the planet, but also um, financial authority as well. And you, you if you look at members of the Knights of Malta, you know, embedded in the U.S. military, embedded not just the U.S. military, all militaries. Uh, it, it reaches a point where you just think, uh, why even try? Because it's hopeless. They've got this whole thing sewn up and they have so much money and power. And uh, what's the point, you know? And so, at that point, so yeah, go uh, ahead. when uh, how, how about secret societies? We have like it's the skull and bones, and uh, especially the Illuminati. Do you think they're still around? The Illuminati, um, it's I they think... had like a psychological operation. Yeah, that name, I think the Illuminati are an offshoot of the Jesuits. They might come from this Spanish group called the Alumbrados, the Illuminated Ones. 
they they definitely exist you know they they are uh, historical fact uh some people i think people are led to believe that they control the world you know the all seeing eyes above everything that's absolutely un untrue i will say that skull and bones is being overseen by well, the House of Windsor has a big role in, in Skull and Bones. Yale was set up uh, by the British House of Russell, I think. There's some connection with Tavistock as well. Do you know about the Tavistock Institute? It sounds familiar, but not particularly. The Tavistock uh, Institute of Human Relations, it's outside London. Uh, they got their start uh, early in the 20th century. Uh, it was important that this big new war that Edward VII, although he passed away in 1911, he would, that was his whole aim was, you know, Germany was up and coming in the world. Bismarck had broken from the British. He had, he had uh, decided to sign up with the American. Back in those days, there was something called the American system of economics, and it had to do with development and production and building steel mills and, and um, railroads. And Bismarck had said, you know, this free trade nonsense with the British, what are we getting out of it? You know, sorry. And he signed up with the Americans and um, uh, Lincoln's economic advisor. I can't think of his name right now. But he had, uh, he had gone over there and, and consulted with the Germans and they began building extensive railway systems and really becoming a powerhouse. And Brit Britain couldn't compete. They didn't have the will, they didn't have the knowledge. So the only, op the only option was to, you know, like when you're, you're playing chess with somebody and they are losing, so they knock over the board. That was essentially the idea. Edward VII set up a situation where, you know, everything went up in flames and all of the progress, um, all of the, the incredible development that was happening throughout, not only in, in uh, Germany, but Russia as well. You know, we, the United States exported their, the, their know-how and, and their technicians to Russia as well. They were building rail, railroads there as well. And steel there was a steel industry in japan also so you have a sense of britain which is a sense essentially venetian that's kind of a link that maybe we we won't have time to get into today but the infiltration of of great britain by by the venetian party which um we're seeing we're seeing evidence of this uh, today if we look at what's happening in in palestine look at the development of Israel, we see this epistemological, uh, very sneaky kind of, uh, the manipulation of religions, the manipulation of secret societies. If, if, if you were come right down to it, uh, Zionism is a spinoff of British Freemasonry, uh, beginning, going back to the 19th century. So, yeah, in answer to your question, Skull and Bones very much, you know, I, George Bush was a knight of the British Empire. Um, CIA was basically set up by MI6, and that means they're taking orders from, from the Royal Institute of International Affairs and ultimately from the Privy Council. Uh, unfortunately, uh, little by little, I would say that the um, assassination of John F. Kennedy was sort of the end for the United States. And at that point, the United States is doing nothing but doing the imperial will of the British. You look at all the wars we've gotten into, look at everything we've done. There's nothing vaguely American about it. We've been hoodwinked, we've been fooled, you know? So let's see, where was I? Where was I? Um, what do you think? What do you think about the idea that the uh, the America, you, the U.S. is the military branch of the Illuminati, and the London is the financial center, and the Vatican is the religious center? I've heard uh, something like that before. Yeah, I've heard that too. I would say that 
Yeah, uh, definitely the United States is the military wing of the British Empire. The, mil the United States is not in control. It does not take the lead. This whole notion that the British, oh, we they had their empire, but now they're just second fiddle playing along to the tune that the Americans play. Uh, this is total nonsense. They're still very much uh, in control of our foreign policy and our domestic policy as well. Uh, but I would say that Geneva is more powerful than uh, either London or Washington. Um, most of these op most of these major operations come from the uh, the oligarchs in 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 Geneva. Uh, the heart, as I said, the heart is still in Venice. The the methodology, the the will to conquer the world. And that essentially extremely sort of like like the Jesuits, there's no morality. It, you can kill, you can rape, you can kidnap people, you can steal. But if you're doing it in the interests of your superior to fulfill an, an order, then it's a virtue. You know, this very, very much close to what I think a lot of people would identify as being Satanism. The um, the from from what i understand the elites worship saturn the god saturn which uh -huh. is which is actually just uh satan uh, there's a link there between also set from egyptian mythology a god of chaos and the foreigners and the, the desert so, so from what I understand, they worship Saturn. And do you want to know an idea I have about why, yeah. why the bloodlines are so important? In Egyptian mythology, we have the story of Osiris, who was killed by his brother Seth. And then he is resurrected again through the, youth, through, uh, the help of Toth. He's resurrected. And he and o Osiris, and uh, the re resurrected Osiris, and Isis have a child who is Horus. Mm -hmm. And Osiris is re Osiris can't stay in the the living realm permanently. So he goes back to the underworld. But then he is reborn in his son Horus. I think the elites have figured out how to uh, the how to choose their next vex vessel for their incarnation. So that's why the bloodlines are so important, because they're reborn. In their children. That's really interesting. I mean, I know uh, something about that some people maintain that the the pharaonic bloodlines, that the important families of Europe, come from Egypt, that there is a pharaonic bloodline. But I also know, since I've been in Mongolia, you know, the idea of reincarnation that you know some people think of it as a belief but since i've been here i've talked to so many young kids who remember their past lives or i hear you know adults tell me oh my son you know every year we have uh what's called sagansar and uh the whole family gets together it's kind of like uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's all in one. You know, it's a three day, usually goes on for five days. And uh, we, uh, you know, at, at the last, uh, was, no, this was about five years ago. A uh, little boy, my nephew, he said, uh, I, I was an old woman and I had a cow. And if I had my cow again, I would be happy. <laughs> and then I, I was like, wow, this is really heavy. Another kid around the same time, he was telling his parents that he fell on a hiking trip and died. He, he dropped his cell phone and tried to retrieve it and had fallen and died. And his parents knew that this had happened in a, in a uh, something called Amax. They're like states far away. They had read about this event. But I also had 
uh, a young person, a teenager, I was telling her, I said, do you know, have you heard about these kinds of stories? She said, oh yeah. She said, I'm my own uh, great grandmother. <laughs> and I said, I said, wow, how, how does that work? And she said she had gone to visit her grandmother and her grandmother showed her some belongings that her mother had had and said, you know, look, these are my mother's things, her hairbrush, her mirror, you know, her nice things. And my, this young person said, oh yeah, I, I, and she started talking and describing the items and explaining where she got them. And she said, those are mine. And her grandmother said, well, the only explanation is that this is, uh, this is my mother. And I've talked, uh, I've talked to a lot of people. They say that this is fairly common in Mongolia. People come back in their families again and again. So I, I don't rule out uh, something like that. That's a really interesting. I've never heard that in relation to uh, the nobility of Europe. Yes, the, usually Christians don't believe in reincarnation, but the Rosicrucians have a tradition of believing in uh, reincarnation. And I'm a Rosicrucian myself. Ah. Believer in the Prisca Theologia. I used to, I lived in, uh, when I was a teenager, lived in San Jose, San Jose, California, and there's a Rosicrucian museum. Do you know of it? No, I, I said, I know there's a temple. I don't know if there's a museum, museum as well. That's awesome. Maybe there. Maybe it's a temple and a museum. I remember there were some buildings that we weren't allowed to go to, but it had, you know, the whole Egyptian style structures and images and statues. And it was fairly close to Santa Clara University, which is a Jesuit college. And it was in an area of town called uh, the Rose Garden area. So awesome. I was kind of exposed to that. But I definitely believe in reincarnation. I have no idea how it works, but I've just heard too many stories. Uh, I can't discount all of them. Uh, it's it's very very interesting. This whole as I get older, you know, this the relationship between the so-called this world and the next, or the spiritual world and this world, becomes just more and more enticing and more and more kind of baffling and fascinating. I find myself just kind of dwelling on it. And part of it is, you know, investigating, looking into the black nobility. These people who are willing to do anything to hold on to this power, this money, and to expand it and to uh, consolidate it and to hand it down, you know, I'm thinking, God, I, it just doesn't mean that much to me. I know there's another world and I can't imagine, you know, hatching a plan to kill billions of people uh, just so that I and my little circle of 139 families can hold on to wealth and hold on and increase our power. It just doesn't, doesn't mean that much to me. And, uh, and then I suppose also uh, talking to Ian and then connecting with you, you know, with these, these traditions that are actually trying to penetrate these mysteries and trying to understand this relationship and the, the deeper underlying, uh, uh, what would you call it, uh, the mystical tradition? I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I'm, I'm really Mystery ignorant schools. about, yes, I'm really, I don't know much about these things, but I'm becoming more interested. I used to be like, oh, you know, come on, you know, but since, uh, you know, Ian, I definitely, you know, when you when you talk to him, you definitely okay. There's something here. I don't know what it is, but I'm not going to I'm not going to discount it anymore. I'm going to see what I can learn about it because it does figure very highly. Um, when you go back to, you know, the Venetian families come from a tradition that's really pre-Christian. It goes back to the the Delphic Apollo. The, the Delphic um, origins and the, the myth, the cult of Apollo, and then it goes back to these older uh, traditions, these Gnostic traditions. And I was going to ask you if you can just maybe elaborate a little on what what Gnosticism means to you, or what. Uh, well, Gnosticism is 
the search for gnosis or knowledge, uh, direct experience with the divine, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a very in individualistic philosophy. It doesn't really believe in a lot of dogmas and so on and so forth. Gnost Gnostics are pretty much open-minded. Um, we have several different branches of Gnosticism, like uh, the Valentinians and the Sethians and so on and so forth. And the the uh, the Sethians, I think, and some other schools, they believe that the universe is a prison for your soul, like you're trapped in matter and by a, an evil god. or a, uh, They call him Sucklas, the fool, like uh, a, a malevolent god that, that's created all of this. But the, the Valentinians have a different view. It's more like the Platonic view. They believe that the Demiurge is good, but that materialistic life is a bit flawed. He 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 was a, a flawed being, pretty much. And then then you have the the what I follow, which uses the word gnosis a lot as well, and that is hermeticism. And hermetics believe that the universe is a beautiful creation made in the image of God. Ah. Oh. So, a bit, a bit they, about... They let's seem... Go, they go ahead. They seem like different levels of awareness or, or vibrational. They might cor correspond to vibrational states. You know, like definitely some days I feel like, God, this is a prison. I feel trapped. Why, you know, I need to transcend this. This is insanity. Who would... I never signed up for this, you know? <laughs> And then other times I have these moments where I feel like, yeah, this is all a wonderful creation of the highest, and I'm just one with it. Uh, there's nothing other than consciousness in this kind of miracle of, of creative awareness that gives rise to everything. And you get this wonderful kind of euphoric, harmonic, harmon harmonious uh, feelings of oneness with it. So these kinds of levels of Gnosticism might correlate to your level of uh, awakening, or what do you think? Yeah, that's exactly it. I think from 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 I think I read it somewhere that in the mystery schools, like the the Templars are very Gnostic as well. That if there are different levels. You you start out with believing that the demiurge is evil and flawed, and then once you go higher up. You start getting into the realm of hermeticism and so on and so forth. That's well, that, that was pretty much my journey as well. Ah, from Gnost from Gnostic to hermetic. Ah, okay. How long? How long did this take you? And was this a conscious process or? Um, it took me about maybe a couple of years, three, four years, something like that. Uh, I'm not sure, it, what, like a conscious project, what what that means. I'd say maybe like an eternal, like groping or working towards something, even if you don't know exactly what it is. I studied a lot. I see. Through yeah. the path of study, that's probably the, the very reliable, without too much torment, right? <laughs> and the, if you, plenty of, plenty if you of have, torment still. <laughs> oh really? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, me too. Oh my god. Nothing yeah, is free I... here. No, no time to get a free lunch. <laughs> yeah, damn. I really hate that. And even those moments of awakening, you're like, wow, how did that happen? You know, why couldn't have I? Why couldn't I have had that 15 years ago? You know. Yeah. And it's so difficult to put these things into words. Um, but I, I think it's a nat kind of a natural segue going from this feeling of, oh, my God, we, what, what can we do against powers that, you know, associated with the black nobility? Uh, you could look at it as a, as, um, a spiritual struggle between you know, the old, the Guelphs versus the Ghibellines. The Ghibellines are represented by the Hohenstaufen, the, uh, the um, 
tradition of Charlemagne. These were city builders. These are people who wanted to build up communities and empower people. Uh, and then the Guelphs who were pro-Pope, but not from a religious sense of being pro-Papal, but just that they had uh, they had a taste of the amount of prestige and power that were that was associated with being bankers to the Pope and with monetarism and speculation and bullion speculation and uh, seizing trade routes and all these things, the ability to and the ability to make money from money. Uh, this sort of amoral, uh, city-centered, um, very um, cynical worldview versus the other side, which maybe you could say was epitomized by Florence, uh, where that we are created in the image of God, Imago Dei, and we have something called creative reason and we can exercise that and we can penetrate the secrets of the universe and we can solve problems creatively. Whereas, you know, Venice and the Guelphs were very much wanted to stamp out any awareness of that because it was seen as a great threat. Um, some you, people have, go ahead. Do you know that it doesn't say we were created in God's image? It says we were created in the image of the Elohim. It is plural. Mm. Christ, it, Israel, it, it, Judaism, I, 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 the Israelites used to be polytheistic. And that, that was written out of the Bible. But we still have have some clues left, like Elohim being plural. They, you know, mm. if, you read the, if you read the passages, it says created in our image, in our ah, ah, yeah. wow nobody says that you know i've never heard that before <laughs> yeah um, i've covered it a lot on my channel okay i'm gonna have to listen more i'm sorry like the last the last few weeks have been i you know we bought this uh, apartment this new apartment we were supposed to move in uh, back in January, and because of the economic brick wall that we all hit, you know, everything came to a standstill directly as a result of COVID. And we're still, I'm still in this, it's like a little one room apartment. I'm just, I got, I carved out a little time where I could be alone in relative peace and, and uh, talk to you. But uh, there's been so much going on. We've been involved in a, in um I could have, you know, I'm more tangentially involved. I'm kind of hidden because I'm a foreigner, but uh, this, I can't name any names or be very specific, but it, it's um, involves a journalist in uh, Inner Mongolia, which is China. And he was, he was taught, he was writing about the experience of the Inner Mongolians in under uh, in China and um, had had some problems with the authorities even here in the country of uh, Mongolia and uh, uh, I can't, I really can't, I can't say any more about this, but it's been kind of a wild ride. And there... we've been, we, we've been doing, you know, I've, we've been staying, we've been staying fairly active. Um, working not in any official capacity, but, staying relevant, staying busy and working, making contacts and working toward building up, uh, you know, this, um, the idea of an international law center. So, but having, having to be very careful about uh, taking steps and taking a few timid steps and then wondering why are we not getting anywhere? And then, the more I learn, the more I understand what we're what we're up against. And I think uh, what what we can do is very much on the lines of what we were just discussing about hermeticism. These are avenues that are not closed to us. We may feel overwhelmed by. And I taught I told my wife about this, you know, as we're working together on this. And she's like, oh, my God, you know, 
it seems like it's hopeless. We just seem completely overpowered. We should just try to forget all of this and just try to live normal lives. I said, well, uh, we still have those inner, we, have, we still have the inner journey. We still have access to tremendous amounts of power uh, just, through the, just through being alive. And I think what you said about hermeticism uh, sort of, to me, illuminates uh, the very real possibility that all of us have. I, I continue to believe that if you had enough people who are awakening to a certain point, we can influence the whole system. And like I said at the beginning, I don't necessarily judge these people. Oh, these are evil people. They're the worst. They're devils. They're psychos. They're, they're, you know, they're born into this just like we're, we're born into it. I dare anyone to be born into a system that's been um, conditioning the human psyche uh, down to a physiological level for thousands of years and that somehow you're not going to be uh, you know a creature of of those traditions some of these darker traditions for instance um so it could very well be that some of these families will be the key to uh, a liberation and if if we uh to the extent that we wake up i think that that might trigger certain state changes of states in our immediate environment uh, I this is one thing that's been really baffling me. I think God, there must be some families, some of these people who still hold out or still hold uh, value within them, the the nation building tradition of the Hohenstaufens of the of the of of Charlemagne, who still believe that we have this incredible spark that can create absolutely anything we can imagine that we would associate with the, the works of Nicholas of Cusa or Dante Alighieri uh, with the Italian Renaissance uh, that we still, that's, that's wide open. Who, who are the people out there? They, they have to be out there. I just don't know who they are yet. And that's one of the things I'm going back to Vienna in um, April, I think. And then I'll, I'll look around, I'll talk to people, I'll see, is there some, is there anyone who's on this wavelength who understands that uh, killing mass numbers of people and um, denying that kind of, that, that infinite potential of human beings is probably not a good thing, you know, that if, if we all try to uh, cultivate or husband that that infinite potential of uh, in humanity everybody would be better off you know you could live in a person who enjoys uh you know the the prerogatives of a of a tyrant because they feel they secure certain benefits to themselves they 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 might see that they could live in a mu even a much better place if uh if everyone were able to exercise their creative reason and we had we took the lid off we took the shackles off you know i mean my god we still have slavery slavery is worse than ever these days yeah there are more slaves alive now than ever in history yeah and uh it's it's like uh, just when you think uh things can't get worse they do <laughs> and uh, what's it going to take you know um i'm curious but, what 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 is there a connection between the Federal Reserve and the Black nobility? Seems like something they would do. Oh yeah, I, I can't remember right now, but the Federal Reserve has some uh, ties directly with what? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on it. Something is something I just learned recently. It might be the House of Farnese. I know the House of Farnese. They had a pentagonal fortress that the pentagon is based on the federal reserve is also based on uh, one of the palaces of one of these italian families so they're behind all of it the federal reserve the um the treasury 
maybe the tre the treasury is based on the uh, the Villa Torloni, I think. So right. Awesome. So you this been this has been a great time. I think it's about time I we wrap it up. I don't want to take any more of your time. Uh, you said you were working on some project with uh, international law. Is there anything like you can give a shout out, like anything that people can help with if they want to, donations, etc. Um, yeah, any good, any goodwill. I mean, what I'm really trying to do, I realized that <clears throat> we can't accept help from established organizations or from academia or any kind of government institution or any NGO anywhere, because then you're opening the door to infiltration and, and the kind of subterfuge of your basic, if you have a pure intention, uh, people are going to come in through those portals and, uh, and pull you one way or another. And next thing you know, you don't even recognize what it is you are trying to do. So if I'm open to anybody who has ideas on how you develop, um, I tried to do crowdfunding a few years ago, but people, you know, people were like, wait, you have these connections to Kunmin University, Santa Clara, uh, this and that, you know, the Habsburgs, you can't get any money from them. Uh, maybe you're kind of not uh, on the level, right? I'm like, <laughs> I, I know I can't, you know, we're, we are, uh, one i think that i think the big uh the big tragedy is that law has been taken hostage by politics and as they say weaponized and so if anybody knows of a way that we can begin to build i'd like to build an institute a place of study with a library i'd like to have uh symposia and eventually maybe some tribunals and a place, what I'd love to do is have a place where people can come from all over the world and discuss anything, absolutely anything, openly and freely, uh, as long as they preserve the spirit of goodwill and uh, good faith, good faith arguments, logical arguments, honor and respect of other people, and have um, and work toward uh, real solutions based on based on logic and reason and uh, and our creative faculties and i still believe that that mongolia is the place to do it just because of its location because of the tremendous uh, amazing spirit of the people and when people come here they feel like they're coming to some place very special and uh they kind of they clear away every all of the baggage you know and get down to business and the people like to you know our friends from Korea and Japan like to go to the countryside and, and experience that Mongolian life, the nomadic lifestyle, and they feel that they're connecting to something that they that it's new to them and awakens something in them. Um, people here are very globally conscious, and not in that kind of brainwashed way of the West, but you know the young people here, it's amazing. They're they're aware of everything that's going on all over the planet. So uh, I think, yeah, so given that that's the project that I want, I'd like to have a place where people can come and talk about anything, uh, no holds barred except respect and high the very highest principles and um, in, in spirit of inquiry and, and the real, the, real uh, the, the transcendental principles of law, you know, on the very highest level and begin to address. I think all of the issues could be solved eventually, but we first need a place where we can do that. We have some good places we could begin to set things up. We have uh, good contacts. We're just waiting on the funds and it's a very, it's been very difficult to get things going, but I'm not complaining. I, I, I expect this and uh, I'm not giving up. I'm just getting going actually. I look back at the last 10 years, it's like, okay, that 10 years kind of flew by. What can I do? So the next years don't, next 10 years do not fly by like that. I'm going to get more done, figure out what's really going on, how to focus myself better, um, tactically take off, take, get rid of more of my naivete. 
So do you have do you have an email address people can contact you at, for example? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, maybe I can maybe I can text it to you. It's Jimenez J I M E N E Z dot Mongol Justice M O N G O L J U S T I C E at gmail dot com. And I also have a YouTube Perfect. channel, J Philip oh, Jimenez. Yeah. There we go. Yep. I have a terrible, my YouTube channel is terrible, but I just keep it up there because I know I'm going to make it a good one someday. It's going to be like, like yours, like professional, <laughs> like your channel is so nice, you know, oh, and I'm looking you. forward to poking around at it more and, and opening myself up to some of these, these topics that I'm really deficient in. So could you say the name of your uh, YouTube channel again? I interrupted you. It's just my name. <clears throat> J. Philip Jimenez, J. Period Philip with one L Jimenez, J. I. M. E. N. E. Z. And I'll put, uh, I'll put both in the description. Ah, okay. All right, this All has right. been a, a a great conversation. I I have to have you on some time again. Yeah, that would be great. I was hoping for that because I, I really feel that I'm very scattered. I don't have the discipline of the scholar and I'd like to pull something together. I just needed to get a sense of what, what you were interested in, how things would go. But it would be great to uh, have another discussion. Yes. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.